Okay, so welcome everyone to uh, today's Aspen Center for Physics Colloquium. Uh, I'm Mike Kimberly, one of the organizers of the Physics and Information Workshop going on here right now. And it's my real pleasure to introduce Matthew Fisher from UC Santa Barbara. So Matthew hardly needs an introduction at all. Uh, and I think rather than uh, trying to list his many remarkable accomplishments, I'll just say something pretty brief. Uh, so I'd like to think not too long ago now, uh, still less than 20 years ago, uh, Matthew was my PhD advisor at UCSB, and I was very lucky so early in my career to learn through working with Matthew that uh, at its best, theoretical physics is uh, a shared exploration of qualitatively new and really exciting ideas. Um, and, uh, and it's something that should be really fun and it's something that we do together at its best. And uh, I also think that has a lot to do with what we're all doing here in Aspen right now. Um, so uh, with that, um, welcome to Matthew, who will speak about monetary quantum dynamics. And uh, before we get started, I should say just to, uh, Handle questions. Uh, so, uh, for those in the room, please feel free to raise your hand and ask a question at any time. Uh, if you're on Zoom, uh, we ask you to defer your questions until the QA at the end. And during the QA at the end, if you're on Zoom and you have a question, just please use the raise hand function. And uh, I can see you and I'll be able to call. And if you're in the room, just raise your hand. Okay, well, Mike. My... Well, you know, thank you so much, Mike. I mean, you know, I would say almost all, except that I've had success in my career so far, it's because of having students like Mike. And uh, I've been just absolutely blessed with amazing grad students and postdocs throughout the years. And uh, it's been a real pleasure. Um, so this talk, well, you know, I think some of you have probably heard versions of this talk, and so my apologies to those. Um, and um, it, early in this week, Adam now gave a sort of introduction to this very topic, so maybe a bit redundant to some of you. Some of you but hopefully there's people in the audience who, who haven't heard this. Um, and in some sense, what this talk is, is uh, me, Matthew Fisher, trying to learn quantum information theory. Um, you know, I'm a quantum antibody theorist for now 40 years or so. And um, you know, in, in quantum antibody theory, we're mostly interested in um, equilibrium phases of electrons and spins in crystalline solids exclusively. Um, and what I want to do in this talk is, is a bit different, is talk about open quantum systems, and in particular, a special type of open quantum systems, which we call monitored quantum systems. And these systems are out of equilibrium, they're intrinsically dynamical, uh, and nevertheless, they have interesting qualitative phases and phase transitions that I want to talk about. Uh, and in particular, I'll stress the, you know, the, the sort of initial uh, measurement driven entanglement transition, which you know, stimulated my interest in this subject, um, and talk a little bit about you know, more, recent, uh, more recent work as well. Um, let me if I can actually move my slides forward. There we go. Uh, so let me start by thanking my, really some of my collaborators. And I particularly want to emphasize Yao Dong Li, who's uh, got his PhD uh, from UCSB and has got a postdoc at Stanford with Vedica. And he's responsible for almost everything I know about this, this topic. And Chao Chen's at Boston College, Sagar, who's here, maybe in the audience, I don't know. Um, and Andreas Ludwig, who's a faculty at UCSB as well. Um, so, okay, yeah. So, you know, quantum matter, let me start with quantum matter and then move on to, you know, sort of quantum information theory, if you will. So traditional quantum condensed matter physics studies very large collections of atoms, electrons, spins usually in solids. And, you know, one of the underlying themes is of emergence, that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. From that one gets collective phases of matter, such as crystalline solids, superconductors, electron quantum hole effect states. And each of these uh, emergent phases um, have universal properties associated with them, which are independent of the microscopic details. So for example, uh, all crystalline solids have quantized phonon excitations, both uh, longitudinal and transverse in particular, um, independent of what the atoms are that make up the solid, uh, 
Well, self-respecting superconductors did the Meissner effect. If you cool them down in a small enough magnetic field, they expel the magnetic field. And the fractional quantum hole effect, um, you know, by its very name, has uh, Schwartz excitations with fractional charge. And that's you know, a very sort of a universal feature of that. And it doesn't depend on details such as um, whether this, uh, you know, which, which of the two dimensional electron gases one is dealing with or um, you know, how in, within range is uh, how, much, how many impurities you have and so forth. Um, so, uh, you know, quantum matter theory, you know, we look at Hamiltonians, of course, as I think we all know. Um, the Heisenberg, you know, antiferromagnet is a good model for some insulating crystalline solids. Um, and we typically focus on ground states and thermal equilibrium properties. So the density matrix is just the Boltzmann weight with some Hamiltonian. Um, and we characterize the quantum phases and phase transitions by order parameters, at least um, over the decades, order parameters, and more recently on using topology and topological characters of the, the phases. Um, but really in the last 10 or, or, or so years, there's all these beautiful experimental platforms uh, for many body physics. Um, you know, noisy intermediate scale quantum computers, uh, you know, John Preskill uh, labeled this era that we're in. Um, you know, there are superconducting qubit arrays like um, at Google where they had this, um, uh, you know, the Sycamore processor where they demonstrated, at least argued to be demonstrated quantum supremacy. Um, ultra cold atoms is more of a, is less digital, it's an analog quantum simulator, kept ions is more digital. And, and as I learned yesterday that Hubert atoms can be both you know, analog uh, simulators as well as digital, digital simulators. I think these Rydberg atoms really are pretty exciting. Um, you can control, you can really move the atoms wherever you want and create any sort of lattice that you want and address individual, individual atoms. Um, so these new uh, experimental platforms lead for new opportunities uh, for you know, quantum antibody theorists. And you know, rather than working with quantum Hamiltonians, uh, even though one might sometimes one's still working, of course, with quantum Hamiltonians, might be working with quantum circuits, particularly for the digital um, quantum simulators, digital quantum computers. And rather than looking at ground states in equilibrium, one is going to be looking at non-equilibrium dynamics. Systems are invariably you know, open. One op has open quantum systems, and the role of measurement is plays an absolutely essential role. And measurement is really going to be the underlying theme in what I'm going to be talking about today. It's basically trying to look at quantum antibody physics through the eyes of experimentalists that can make detailed measurements on the microscopic scale. Uh, and you know, rather than looking at order parameters, uh, uh, we would be looking at things like quantum entanglement and other entanglement measures, like an entanglement entanglement entropy. There's this wonderful book, Quantum Information Meets Quantum Matter by these four authors. Um, let's get the order wrong, Zheng, Chen, Zhao, and Wen. Um, and uh, um, quantum information meets quantum matter. I mean, in some sense, you know, I'm viewing this as the other way around, quantum matter meets quantum information theory. So once again, quantum matter theory, you know, we're essentially always interested in the thermodynamic limit, interest in ground states, exotic order, quantum criticality, and so forth. And traditionally, quantum information theory, uh, at least originally as related, uh, you know, often looks at few qubit systems, but they're, you know, looking at open systems and non-equilibrium systems and, and measurements play an important role. In this talk, I want to sort of describe efforts to, you know, look at the boundaries between quantum matter theory and quantum information theory by looking at quantum phase transitions, which are driven by measurements in open non-equilibrium systems in the thermodynamic limit. Um, and the common thread that is going to run through the talk, besides measurements, is the entanglement entropy, how entangled these quantum degrees of freedom are with one another. Um, see. Okay, so entropy, you know, so let me just, uh, to be complete, talk about thermal entropy first. So if we have a quantum system or a classical system for that matter, in contact with a thermal bath at temperature KT, the mixed state uh, density matrix, which would describe the statistical mechanics, the quantum system mechanics of that is just E to the minus beta H. And the entropy, the um, entropy is trace of rho log rho. And if you're at finite temperature, the main thing about the entropy is it's extensive. If you make the system twice as big, the entropy is 
it goes up uh, by a factor of the two. And the entropy is just from state counting. Um, it basically counts the number of states that are available in a given energy window, that, that temperature. Um, Kangman entropy is you know, very sort of closely related to the thermal entropy, but it's a little bit different. Uh, it's usually defined in terms of just a, a quantum system in a box with a single eigenstate, or it doesn't even have to be a single eigenstate, just a single quantum state. Um, and uh, the density matrix is pure, it's the outer product of psi with itself. And in a bipartition, one can divide just conceptually the, the box into region A of size L and the region B, the rest of the region. Um, and one can uh, trace out the degrees of freedom in region B uh, to get the, what's called the reduced density matrix in A. And the reduced density matrix in A gives one um, all the information that is available to uh, an, an observer or an experimentalist who is living in this region A that contains all that information. If they're not allowed to go into the region B, you, tra you can trace those degrees of freedom out. Um, and then the entanglement entropy is the von Neumann entropy of the reduced density matrix where you now trace over A of rho A log rho A. And the entanglement entropy, uh, I mean, it, it's intuitive, it, 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 its name is intuitive. I mean, it basically tells you how much the one mechanical degrees of freedom in A are are entangled with degrees of freedom in B. Um, and it's been very useful in more traditional many body physics in the last 15 years in characterizing uh, ground states and, and thermally excited states of Hamiltonians. So particularly if you have a ground state of a quantum Hamiltonian and it's got a, a gap uh, to its excitations, uh, the entanglement entropy for the degrees of freedom A with those in B uh, is, is what's called an area law. And it's just, entanglement is just across basically the cut uh, between A, A and B. So ground states manifest a lot of spatial locality. Um, and that makes them in some sense, very, very simple. Um, thermally excited states are, are high energy excited state for a Hamiltonian uh, finite, with finite energy density above the ground state. Uh, those uh, states have what's called volume law entanglement entropy. And uh, the, so the, the entropy entanglement of this region A uh, scales with the volume of that uh, region A. And that's similar to the you know, thermal entropy at finite temperature, which is, which is extensive. Indeed, uh, the, you know, for in the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, if you take a single eigenstate and compute the entanglement entropy density, this little s here, it's equal to the thermal entropy at, uh, at a temperature which corresponds to that uh, energy density. Um, so finite energy density states, you know, which you would think would be classical, right? you know, high temperature, high energy, um, are actually you know, very entangled and very quantum mechanical in some sense. So it's kind of counterintuitive actually that at uh, high energy density, you get more, in, more quantum entanglement, it's more local, non-local. Um, <laughs> Uh, but what I wanted to do is talk about quantum circuits. And uh, you know, if we just take a, a single qubit, and this line is supposed to represent that qubit moving along in time, and you can have uh, gates that act on the uh, qubit, uh, unitary gates, uh, for example, uh, an amount operator or one of the Pauli operators, a unitary. Um, and you can have, of course, two qubits. And this is the most general two qubit uh, state. Uh, and uh, when we draw a circuit with two qubits coming along here, then there's a two qubit unitary which acts on qubits one and two. And so if you send in a two qubit state phi n, out comes uh, after the acting with this unitary an outcoming state phi out, which is related to phi n by, by the unitary. And see, these are little quantum circuits, but you can build up the quantum circuits. Um, and what I want to do is now move to many qubits um, and start with. Uh, the dynamics, okay, not equilibrium, we're looking at dynamics, many qubits, but in a closed system. Um, and this is um, um, on some beautiful work uh, I'm going to be talking about briefly here with Adam Nahum and Sagar Vijay and uh, Ruman and Ha um, about five years ago now. Uh, and so what they did is they considered a circuit with very little structure. Uh, 
So here, time is running vertically rather than horizontally. And these red dots correspond to each one as a qubit, and these lines are, in some sense, the world lines of the qubits. Um, and these red rectangles are two qubit unitary gates, which are arranged in this quick work uh, pattern. Um, and basically, uh, each of these uh, two qubit unitary gates, uh, when put together, acts as one big unitary transformation, which relates the uh, incoming state, which one could take, for example, as just to all spins up, to, for, to be simple, uh, to the outgoing state. Um, and the unitaries that build up, uh, you know, uh, it get, I'll specify by use of circuit here. And uh, what uh, these gentlemen were able to show is that if you, even if you start, or if you start with an unentangled initial state, uh, the, but then you look at the outcoming state and you look at the reduced density matrix on region A, by tracing out region B. So you just look at a set of the qubits in this uh, outcoming qubits, um, and you can look at the entanglement entropy of the final states. So you can look at how, uh, uh, how entangled the qubits are after going through this quantum circuit. Um, and what they uh, were able to argue and show analytically uh, is that the entanglement starts unentangled. There's no entanglement initially. You just have a direct product state. All the spins are up, 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 up. Uh, the entanglement spreads ballistically. But the, there's an entanglement uh, um, light cone in some sense. And at long times, it goes into the maximal entropy state. So the entanglement entropy um, of the out, uh, uh, put uh, quantum state uh, is, is a volume law entanglement entropy with maximum uh, coefficient log two. Um, and so, so, so basically, um, oh, when, when these qubits are acted on by this unitary, entanglement entropy goes up. And you know, that's just like entropy going up in a, in a, in a thermal system, you know, when you you let it alone. I mean, if it's in equilibrium, the entropy doesn't go up, but if you start messing with it. Uh, are there some restrictions on the unitaries? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. So um, what they did in, in to make these sort of analytic arguments was they took these unitaries to be random. Each unitary is a, is a random unitary on what's called a har random unitary. Um, but there are special uh, cases where if you take uh, um, unitaries which are in, which are constant in time, but random in space, that would be like quench disorder in a, in a that's matter system. Then you have uh, something called many body localization, or at least many people believe you do. Uh, and then the basically the entanglement spreads very, very slowly. I mean, it maybe goes logarithmically in, in time, the entanglement spread. Um, and so, but sort of for generic uh, unitaries, if you just take uh, make all of the unitaries the same and uh, just sort of a generic unitary, you will get this spreading of the entanglement to the maximum entanglement, the ma maximum entanglement entropy state. Um, you have to work kind of hard to stop entropy going up, <laughs> right? and one way to do it is with with random randomness um, in the, um, the quench randomness. So this is, you know, I guess what I was just saying, a closed system of qubits evolving with unitary dynamics generally will saturate into a maximally entangled volumeable state. And there are the exceptions of this many body localization with temporally quenched disorder. Um, so, uh, you know, maximal entropy is maximum disorder. It's uh, locally, there's little information. There's no information, in fact. And it's just not very interesting. And, um, the way that the entanglement grows is interesting, but in the long time limit is just maximal entanglement, maximal entanglement entropy. Um, so, you know, I, I was very interested in trying to understand how you could control the increase of entropy. Um, and one way you can do it is with measurements. And the way I actually got into this was through my work on the quantum brain, which some of you might know about, and those that don't, don't, uh, don't judge me for it. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, if there are measurements actually going on in a physical system without an observer making those measurements, entanglement spread can be, be suppressed um, and you can get structure. 
Um, but okay, here we're going to be talking about experimentalists in the lab making measurements. I don't want to get into the measurement paradox. Um, so quantum measurements uh, to control entanglement growth. Uh, so let's say you have a single qubit. You measure the Z component of the spin. Um, and we're imagining making a projective measurement. Uh, so the wave function collapses into either zero state or the one state. Okay, and this is a measurement uh, uh, circuit, if you will, in this little uh, dial there. Um, and so basically the state that psi comes in, when a projective measurement is made, you either end up in the state zero or you end up in the state one. Um, and these uh, two st uh, states, zero and one, uh, we sometimes call quantum trajectories. And you have this, these quantum trajectories when you have a monitored circuit, when you have somebody who's monitoring it and making the measurements, and then pulling out the classical information on the results of the measurements and say, oh yeah, I got, got spin up or I, I got spin down. And after the measurement is made, uh, the density matrix is still pure. You still have a pure state. It's, it's important. Um, you can also talk about measurements via density matrices. Um, and again, you have really, it's the same thing. You have these projection operators projecting into either spin up or spin down. And with you know, the Born probability for finding up or down, you again have quantum trajectories. So if you have an incoming density matrix and you make a projective measurement, you, you find zero for the spin or up spin, you have a row zero. And if you find down spin, you have row one. And if you start with a pure you know, density matrix, these would be pure density matrices. Um, now, in contrast to a monitored system where the, the experimental is actually making the measurements, if you uh, imagine that the environment is kind of making the measurements, but the information of the results of the measurement is lost into the environment, that's when one has something called decoherence. And if you sum over the measurement outcomes, like if you don't know results of the measurements, um, and, and the information is, let's say, lost into the bath, uh, then you, you, know, you sum on P alpha rho alpha, um, and the pure state density matrix becomes mixed. There's something called the Krauss representation. Um, okay, so th that's uh, quantum trajectories and monitoring to see quantum trajectories. We wanted to try to control the spread of entanglement by making measurements. Uh, so let me just you know, tell you a little bit about entanglement and measurements. Um, basically, you know, if with one of you I share, we, let's say we share a spin half particle, you know, let's say you and I share a spin half particle, to, you have one, I have one, and then it's entangled in a singlet. If we compute the entanglement entropy between us, um, we get log two. Uh, so that's maximal entanglement entropy. My entropy is low information, and it means we have very little information about our spin because it's entangled with, my spin is entangled with Chandra's spin. But now if Chandra measures the Z component of his spin and finds it up, mine will be down. And so after the measurement, then one has a direct product state. There's no entanglement. Measurement, a local measurement induces disentanglement. Uh, low entropy, low entanglement entropy is high information. You made the measurement, you pulled out classical information. That's what you've, what you've got. Um, and so after the measurement, the entanglement entropy is in fact, uh, would, be, would be zero in this, this simple case. Uh, but in general, if you, if you have a region A and a region B and you make measurements in region A, and you average over the measurement outcomes, entanglement entropy, uh, you can show it, uh, uh, in region A, re region B is, is, is no bigger than it was beforehand. It, it either stays the same or goes down. Um, so local measurements induce disentanglement. And so what you wanna do is control entanglement growth via local measurements. Uh, but when you, once you start talking about measurements, you really are dealing with an open system. Um, you know, the, experimental practice. And so um, the open quantum systems is really, there are two classes in some sense. Uh, the one that's much more common and familiar perhaps um, is when you have a system that's coupled to a bath or an environment. So you could have quantum spins in a solid which is coupled to the phonons, for example. Even if you start in the initial pure density matrix, maybe all the spins are up, let's say. Uh, due to the couples of the phonons, the environment is measuring the system in some sense, but the results lost and you get decoherence and the dynamics of the density matrix becomes mixed. And uh, if it's a Markovian environment, which maybe phonons wouldn't be, but if it's a Markovian environment, uh, the dynamics of the mixed state density matrix is 
described by so-called Lindblad equation. In contrast to this decoherence, I want to be talking about these monitored. This is monitored by an observer. So an initial pure state is measured and stays pure. The observer keeps track of the measurements. The wave function evolves as a pure state. And the quantum dynamics is described in terms of wave function quantum trajectories. So what we're really imagining is an ensemble of quantum trajectories. For each of these final states after you run, let's say, the quantum circuit uh, is determined by the measurement outcomes that led up to that, to that final state. Now, if you didn't keep track of those measurement outcomes, and here M is labeling the measurement outcomes, and I mentioned this before, you sum over the probabilities, uh, this is where you get decoherence. You, if you look at the trajectory average density matrix, and for which you can use to calculate average observables, which are linear in the density matrix, then the quantum effects are largely washed out. Basically, if you have a system in, coupled to an environment, it's very difficult to keep quantum coherent effects in the system. I mean, it's almost, almost impossible um, unless you, know, you somehow very cleverly control the environment in some way. But in these monitored systems, uh, the measurements, uh, there's a, there's a density matrix conditioned on the measurement outcomes. So there's a pure state density matrix for each of these measurement results, and there's a reduced density matrix for the states, psi one through psi five. And you can look at the entanglement entropy of each of these output states. Um, I may call that S sub A uh, with script M. And you can then, uh, let's say, average the entanglement entropy over the quantum trajectory. So this is something which is nonlinear in the density matrix. Um, and that's what we're going to be looking at uh, in these monitored systems. Uh, so these monitored quantum trajectories are going to reveal uh, entanglement phases and phase transitions, which I want to talk about. OK, so I'm going to talk about this uh, so-called hybrid quantum circuit. And now, in addition to these you know, brickwork pattern of unitary gates, as we had before, we're going to be sprinkling in uh, measure, Q, single qubit measurements. And, um, and, and there's going to be a competition. So the unitary evolution in, induces entanglement growth, and the measurement induces disentanglement. Um, and so we want to explore the competition between the unitary evolution and measurements and um, following the wave function quantum trajectories. So this is a, because of these making these measurements, this is a really a non unitary uh, dynamics. Um, and the particular model that I'll describe now, just for the next few minutes, is a randomly chosen two qubit unitaries, um, single qubit measurements made with probability P. So everywhere you could make a measurement of a, of a single qubit, the Z component of spin, uh, you uh, flip a bias coin, and with probability P, you make that measurement. So P is basically the sort of the rate of measurements. And you run the circuit for long times, this hybrid circuit with these entangling unitaries and these disentangling measurements. Um, and you, uh, let's say, compute the pure state bipartite entanglement entropy of the final outcoming, outcoming state. And then maybe you average over the measurement outcomes or average over the unitaries in the circuit. Um, so we really only, in this model, we have one parameter, which is P which is the, the rate of making the single qubit measurements, yeah? Each measurement is a projective. The projective measurement, that, that's what we're considering. You can consider weak measurements. Then similar to the environment, or is it, again, different class? No, weak measurements, as long as, you, as long as you record the measurement outcome, it's going to be more like a projective measurement. It's not like the environment. The environment, it, the result of the weak or or projected measurement is, is um, not recorded, it's lost. Um, I mean, a weak measurement, you can couple the you know, qubit you're measuring to an ancilla qubit. Then to make the weak measurement, you have to measure the ancilla. <laughs> you are still making a measurement, but it's a, it has a weaker back action on the qubit that you're measuring. How do you use the recorded value? Once you record it, then what do you do in the next? Does it change the next step? Yeah, so when you, when you, oh, you, 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 when you run the circuit, you, um, you compute the born probability for getting the results of a measurement outcome. If it's 50-50, you just flip a coin and, and take one result or the other, and then you just keep going. And so you, you just follow a given trajectory, the circuit. Depending on the outcome. Depending on the outcome, exactly. And so, yeah, each, 
Exactly. The state that, that goes after measurement, let's say you have one of those yeah. little meters, and then the one that goes across, that has in some sense zero local entropy. Yeah, no, exactly. So when you, this qubit here, when you measure it and you find it up, it's kind of decoupled. It has lo no local entropy. You know what its spin is. So with high information measurement. Basically, you're you're turning the state into a state with zero entropy, and that's what that's going through. Exactly. You're turning it into a state with zero entropy by pulling out information. And so low entropy, high information to get full information. Um, yeah. so when you do the averaging and afterwards of your 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 policy trajectory, when you do that with the good more the measurement outcome, so you have to take the measurement outcomes. Well, okay, so you can you can take. I mean, if the circuit is big and you're running it, you know, fairly deep, uh, the entanglement entropy for the pure state is, you know, essentially the, the typical one is the same as the average. But so you can average over the measurement outcomes if you, you know, if you want to do that, and you can average over the unitaries in the circuit. You can average over where you put the measurements uh, in the circuit as well. Um, is that different from something happening to environment the many, many, many measurements? Because if I ignore the measurement outcome, it would be the same. As yeah, no, so it's really, this is pretty, and that's, that's a great question. Thanks. So it really comes back to this. So it's a question of whether you are looking, are you taking an average of the measurement outcomes of the density matrix? That's decoherence. Or you're taking the average over the measurement outcomes of the entanglement entropy of each of the corner trajectories. So those are those are different. So if you take a system that is coupled to an environment and be able to measure every time the entanglement entropy, I would get the same thing. Or because if, if I don't if, if I don't record, if I don't use my measurements, what is the difference? If I don't use my measurements, like every realization of the make an experiment and I'm having very different to some environment. Every realization is something like well, okay. I mean, this is a, this. No, because you can have, you will have a mixed state. I mean, you can actually measure the density matrix using tomography, and you can find out whether it's a mixed density yeah, matrix or pure. Yeah, you do. You need to prepare many copies of the same system. Exactly. Yeah. If I can measure for a single trajectory, like you take a single trajectory to measure many times, and you do it with a single trajectory. If you need for something that's coupled to an environment, would I get the same thing? Well, okay. No, I, I, I think once you're coupled to an environment, you, you have a mixed state density matrix. And if you measure the density matrix, it would be. I mean, okay, the, the problem is with the, okay, so with the trajectories, we want, in order to actually measure the entanglement entropy, you need to, you need to prepare many copies of this state, Psi1, right? So, you, uh, okay. But, okay, so for that, you need it. Yeah. So, so th okay. this you need, yes, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. And that's the, I'll talk about that at the end with the post selection issue. You know, how you're going to get, you know, get the same, how, how you can prepare the same state when there's many different trajectories. And each time you run the system, you get a different final state. You need like, many copies of the same state, exactly. Yeah. That's the difference. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Thanks. Um, so, Okay. This, yeah, this slide, I just a quick question. In this slide you are on, what's, is A the whole thing you're showing? Or no, I mean, uh, yeah, so I'm not really showing it properly, but yeah, so A is some subset of the qubits. Okay. Maybe the middle half or something like that. Yeah. Um, um, Wait, does it have to be continuous region or can it be just segments? Sir? Does A need to be a continuous region or can be You can look at the entang you know the entanglement with any region A. I mean, it doesn't have to be just it doesn't have to be continuous. But you know, it's the simplest to just by partitioning it. I mean you could try partition and then look we call these two regions A and everything else B. It's okay. Um, so there's there's one single single parameter P, which is how many measure the rate of making measurements and um, so, uh, 
So when you make no measurements at all, you get rid of these yellow things, then this is just a pure unitary circuit and you get gro entanglement growth and you get maximal entanglement, volume or entanglement. If you're measuring, if P is one and you're making measurements everywhere, then you get, um, you, if you make a measure this, every spin at a given time step, you would find spin up, this one is down, this one is up and up and down, and it would be a direct product state and you've got rid of all the entanglement. Uh, so the, it, you, know, you could call that area law entanglement or very little entanglement. And that's at P equals one. It suggests that you might have uh, an entanglement uh, phase transition separating uh, a volume law phase from an area law phase. Um, and um, you know, th initially this was not clear that this would be the case. Um, and, uh, you know, one possibility that was, uh, you know, that was put forward by Raoul, and I think with, you know, with the following argument, was that maybe when you make any finite density of measurements, you would always go directly into the area law phase. And my understanding of the argument is basically that um, if you consider this region A, and you make measurements at a finite density in that region, you reduce the entanglement entropy by uh, an amount proportional to A. Uh, so you reduce like the, sort of a volume law amount of entanglement entropy. But the unitaries that act uh, only when it's, the unitaries increase the entanglement only when they act across the ends of the cut. And so it you know, looks like the measurements are gonna dominate. And uh, that argument is correct for the first set of measurements you'd make on what's called a page state if you have a completely random state. Uh, but it turns out that you know, once you run this circuit and you're uh, making measurements and doing unitaries, the quantum state becomes, um, you know, very different in character than a than a random state, and it becomes impervious, more impervious uh, to future measurements. Um, you can have this entanglement transition um, at finite uh, value of the measurement rate. Um, so. Um, yeah, let me see. I'm going much slower than I want, but that's good. Um, I, I, um, so uh, my graduate student, when we first started looking at this, uh, did some numerics on these hybrid Clifford circuits. And I, you can do a direct simulation for maybe 20 qubits. The Hilbert space grows exponentially with L, the number of qubits. Um, and so my student taught me this you know, remarkable quantum information quote technology uh, using uh, Clifford circuits and stabilizers, which are Pauli string operators, and the details of this, for those of you who are familiar, you, you know, this won't help. And for those of you who, um, who are not familiar with Clifford circuits and stabilizers, this won't help either. So, <laughs> so why do I even have this slide? <laughs> well, the, the takeaway message is if you take a special class of unitaries, called Clifford unitaries, and you start with a spe special set of states called stabilizer states, you can keep, rather than keeping track of the all two to the L coefficients of the wave function, you can keep track of just a set of Pauli string operators which stabilize the state. And there's a polynomial uh, number of pieces of information you need to keep track of the state. Uh, and so that because of that, you can simulate circuits, these quantum circuits, with, you know, let's say a thousand qubits. So if you think about, you know, your, your usual quantum Hamiltonian and you're trying to diagonalize it, you know, really you have 40 qubits and you're running out of steam already. But these Clifford circuits, you can do hundreds and hundreds or even thousands of qubits and run the full circuit dynamics on a classical computer efficiently. Um, and, you know, uh, here's some numerical data uh, um, looking at the logarithm of the entanglement entropy at long times versus the logarithm of the size of the region A um, and uh, these different curves for a different measurement rates. This top curve is where you're making no measurements at all. So its slope is maximum. It's a, a volume law entanglement um, and uh, so slope is one. And in fact, all of these have slope one when you start making measurements infrequently and you're in the volume law phase. And then when you make enough measurements and you increase the measurement rate, you have a transition into the area law entangled phase. And when you look at this data, I mean, the transition is the one in black, but it's not completely obvious, you know, exactly where the transition is, but one can nail down the transition by looking at um, uh, something called a mutual information. So if you take this circular, circular system, you put periodic boundary conditions, 
and you divide it into three or four regions. I mean, I guess region A, region B, and then the other regions. And you define, and you ask about the mutual information, which is, tells you something about the correlations between A and B. Find here, that's A plus SB minus SA union B. And uh, in the area law phase, there isn't much entanglement, and these are far apart regions A and B, so there's very little correlations. So the mutual information is, is, is very small, essentially zero when the system size gets large. In the volume law phase, um, the variety of these regions, LA plus LB is less than half the system. Uh, the entanglement uh, is very little actually between A and B because there's so many other degrees of freedom that one can entangle with. Or you can think about the volume of phase as a bit more like finite temperature where you have short range correlations. And so the only place where you get significant uh, mutual information, significant correlations is right at the phase transition. And that's, you can see this peak here. Uh, and these different system sizes, as the system size gets bigger, gets sharper and sharper, and you can do finite size scaling and get a, uh, a critical exponent new. Um, and uh, you know, once you've identified where the phase transition is, you can look at the entanglement entropy right at the phase transition. Um, and, uh, and that looks like a logarithm. The entanglement entropy goes as log of LA. Um, and you know, this is um, the entanglement entropy varying logarithmically with the system size is the same as one um, has at, for the ground states of one-dimensional quantum Hamiltonians, which are at a, a critical point, like the quantum transverse field Ising model at its phase transition point. If you take a region of length L, the entanglement entropy grows as the central charge C times log L. So, uh, and this is, you know, sort of resembles a one plus one dimensional Theory. Sorry? After this coefficient alpha, the 1.6. That's some universal number, and we don't know how to compute it. It's that doesn't come in your Ising model. Your well, okay, so the transverse, yeah, the transverse Ising model, that coefficient would be the central charge divided by three, I think it is. The central charge is one, so it'd be like one third. Yeah, so this is, you know, so this coefficient depends on universality class of this phase transition, which is something that um, we don't. We don't, we don't, in certain limits, we understand it, but we don't understand it, you know, in, in, in uh, uh, yeah. you're plotting something which has to be related to the density of measurements. This P sub C has to be determined by the density of measurements. Exactly. So is well, well, what value is, so it's. Linearly, exponentially, this, is it going to, e to the number of density of measurements, or is it going as. Well, so P is a. Like when you every every qubit at every time step, you you meet, you make a measurement with probability p. So if p is a half, you'd measure half the qubits, half, you know, at each time step. So what's plotted here is on this axis is p, sorry, the, the zero to 0.5. And if you know if you don't make many measurements, you're in the volume law phase. Um, if you make many measurements within the area law phase, and if you tune this p to be like I think it's about 0.16 is a non-universal value. That's like the transition temperature being non-universal. So you have to make all the one measurement. You, exactly. Yeah, no, exactly. Okay, I got the question, thanks. Yeah, it's order one measurements to, to beat that in unitary entanglement growth. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, unitary is a pretty entangling, I guess. Uh, yeah. um, but, um, you can look for conformal symmetry at this critical point, and I think I will skip this. Um, and let me just talk a little bit about the nature of the volume law phase. The area law phase is really, in some sense, not that interesting. It almost looks like just a direct product state with a little bit of dressing. Uh, the volume law phase, there's a piece which grows with the volume uh, LA, and then there's this background piece LA to the beta, where beta from numerics is, is around a third. And this beta being a third can be understood uh, via mapping to a statistical mechanics model, which I will just extremely briefly uh, sketch. And this is work by these authors uh, here. Um, it turns out that by um, doing an ensemble average over these unitaries, you can map a space-time manifold of this circuit to a st two-dimensional statistical mechanics model replicated system mechanics model. So it's rather complicated. Um, and uh, but the systematic mechanics model, you can think of as just being an Ising model for simplicity. Um, 
And, but it's a two-dimensional sort of classical Ising model. Uh, and there's a correspondence between the phases of the statistical mechanics model and the phases of this, the quantum circuit, the entanglement phases of this quantum circuit. The so volume law phase is the ordered phase of the Ising model. It's where these Ising spins would be ordered. Uh, the area law phase is the, is the paramagnetic phase of the Ising model. And the connection, the main connection between this, the quantum circuit and this this mechanical, you know, Ising-like model um, is that the entanglement entropy in the quantum circuit um, is related to the free energy cost in the StatMech model for changing the boundary conditions in the region A. So, so you, what you're supposed to imagine is here is the space-time manifold of the circuit. Here's your Ising model living in here. In this region A, you put downspin boundary conditions, and this everywhere else you put upspin boundary conditions, and so uh, and the so the uh, there has to be a domain wall which separates upspin from the downspin in in the ordered phase of the um, of the of the of the uh, of the stitch mechanics model, and so the free energy is proportional to the length of that um, the domain wall. Um, uh, which is proportional to LA, sigma is a surface tension. And so that's how you get the volume law uh, um, within the statistical mechanics mapping. Um, in the area law phase, uh, that's the disordered phase of the paramagnet. Uh, it's in the paramagnetic phase of the statistical mechanics magnet. Uh, and there these domain walls are proliferated and you just get an order one cost in free energy. That's the area law phase. This background, uh, this background LA to the beta it turns out, and I'll just go through this very quickly, um, it's coming from fluctuations of the entanglement domain wall. I said this this mechanics model is really like at finite temperature. Um, and so this domain wall can fluctuate just like it would in, in a domain wall and Ising model at finite temperature. Um, and also there's, a, there's disorder in the problem. And there's really three types of disorder, the unitaries, the me measurement positions and the measurement outcomes. Um, and so it turns out that the, uh, that the entanglement entropy uh, is given by the free energy of a domain wall uh, moving through a random, you know, a random potential. And this is something called a directed polymer in a random environment. Um, and um, you can work out uh, various, various things are known about this exactly, you know, going back, you know, I don't know, 30 years um, about this problem. And, um, for example, the fluctuations in the free energy, the average free energy goes linearly in A, the, but the fluctuations in the free energy, the, the subdominant goes as LA to the beta, where beta is a third. That's a, a critical exponent of the directed polymer in the random environment. And this wandering exponent is, is, is two thirds. Um, it wanders more than a random walk because of the impurities. Um, and you basically can measure beta is one third and zeta is two thirds by looking at the uh, Clifford hybrid circuit. And here, what I'm just doing is I'm comparing the, the left is the subdominant entanglement entropy in the random Clifford circuit. And on the right is the subdominant free energy for a directed polymer in the random environment, scaled appropriately and they the same. So we understand a lot, you know, a lot about the volume law phase, but, but the volume law phase actually, uh, and the entanglement transition there's another guise to it, uh, which was pointed out by Michael Gullins and David Hughes. Um, you can view this entanglement transition as a purification transition. So if, rather than taking your quantum circuit and starting with a pure quantum state and evolving the quantum circuit, let's say you start with a, uh, a, a maximally mixed density matrix, the density matrix, which is proportional to the identity. Then as you run the circuit, you start making measurements when you make measurements, you tend to reduce the, um, you, you increase the purity um, and you reduce the mi mixedness. Um, and basically uh, what they did is they ran the circuit um, and then they computed for some time proportional to L and then computed the thermal entropy. Um, and um, the, um, what they found is that uh, at long times, thermal entropy uh, in the mixed phase is, is finite, stays finite below PC and is zero uh, in the above PC. So, they, so the volume law phase and the area law phase 
are, are the same as the mixed phase and the pure phase. The only thing is the difference is the initial time boundary condition. Um, the purification transition is the entanglement transition. The difference is one is looking at with a mixed state initial density matrix versus a pure state density matrix. Um, when you start talking about mixed state density matrices and this volume law phase or the mixed phase, it turns out that there's a, um, a way to think about this volume law phase as an encoder of quantum information. Um, and the, basically the unitary scramble and hide the quantum information, you start with your initial state, uh, that information is there, but it, once you run these unitaries and if you make infrequent enough measurements, you don't get any information about that initial state and you end up uh, not, to fully purifying it. Um, and there's connections with uh, this quantum error correcting stabilizing uh, codes, uh, which, I, which I'll skip over. But there's, a, you know, there's a lot of interesting directions here and connections with quantum error correction. But these hybrid circuits, there's a lot of generalizations you can uh, explore. Um, if you measure the stabilizer, uh, uh, stabilizes of the toric code, the terms of the toric code Hamiltonian in single qubit measurements, you get uh, transitions from a topological state to a non-topological state in these monitored circuits. Uh, you can um, work with Vedica and, and uh, Michael Collins, David Hughes. Uh, you can have a measurement only models where you're making multi-qubit measurements with, with non-commuting with one and you can then get a volume law to area law transition as well. You can look at symmetry and rich phases. Uh, there's a lot of in interesting recent work by these authors looking at um, Quantum circuits in which is a which is a conserved U one, which is a, it's like having a fixed number of particles, and then the particles are evolving through these the circuit. And there's uh, arguments for two different phases inside the volume law phase, a phase which purifies in the number quickly, and the, the fuzzy phase which stays impure in the number for longer times. You can also look at these entanglement transitions in in monitored free Fourier chains. You there you get uh, transitions from a, a volume of log entangled states to area law entangled states. Okay, so let me, you know, start wrapping up and talk about the experimental access, which is um, something that it's like the elephant in the room in this whole thing. Um, so when we have said the quantum trajectories reveal the phase transitions, it's entanglement structure of these pure states, averaging over the quantum trajectories. Uh, averaging over the quantum trajectories in the density matrix washes out all of the effects of this entanglement transition. We just not see it. So in order to, I mean, in, in a, the most sort of straightforward way, in order to see this transition experimentally, you need, you, I mean, you need multiple copies of the same pure state. Uh, and so you would have to, uh, you know, run the circuit and find, let's say you end up with the measurement outcomes which take you to psi one, you'd have to run it again. Then maybe you end up with psi three, but then you have to run it many times and you know, and bin it so that when you end up with psi one, you take all those states, <laughs> and then you can use tomography on those on those states psi one, compute the density matrix, and to get the entanglement entropy of that of the state psi one. Now this becomes prohibitively difficult when you have many qubits because the number of measurements um, that you make grows grows with the, the system size and the depth of the circuit, and number of measurement outcomes is exponential in that. So. Um, this is, you know, real. There's a real post-selection problem, um, but I think trying to solve the post-selection problem is in, in and of itself interesting, and I think we're going to eventually overcome it. Um, at this stage, I put a question mark. Uh, there's been attempts, though, um, to access uh, this entanglement transition via but entangling one single qubit to one of the original system qubits looking at the entanglement entropy between the reference qubit and the system qubits by using basically a local probe. Um, and then uh, you try to use the measurement outcomes to do a decoding of your active feedback. Um, and there's an experiment which does, did this uh, by Crystal Noel and, and, and Chris Monroe on an iron trap with a um, you know, small number of qubits. Uh, there's a very nice recent paper you trying to use neural network decoders for this measurement induced phase transition. And there's a transition in the decodability from the, you know, from the decoder, uh, that's my understanding. And it, and it, it can decode in the area law phase, but not in the volume law phase. Um, beautiful work uh, by Vedica and um, collaborators and uh, Tarun Grover. Um, if you can 
uh, sort of space-time duals of unitary dynamics, which looks like unitary plus measurement. So if you sort of view the circuit sideways, it looks non-unitary, and then you can start getting um, some of this physics of entanglement uh, phases. Um, uh, the other thing you can do is employ Clifford circuits, and uh, one boneheaded way you could try to do the get around the post selection is to force a measurement. Be, so if you're following on your classical computer, uh, the, what you're finding on the quantum computer, and so you, you come along here, you get this measurement result, and then you get the measurement result one, and now you come the next time and you get the measurement result two. So the question is, can you back up and then go down, you know, change the path that you took? Well, one knows how to do that with a, in a, in a Clifford circuit. One can compute that uh, you know, for using the stabilizers, and you have to just apply a unitary to do that. So you couldn't make, in principle, make forced measurements. Um, you could also just do brute force, just look at small circuits, and the paper um, from you know, this year, earlier this year, um, where they basically circumvented the post selection challenge by just using brute force, literally. I mean, they. I mean, it's kind of amazing, like 5,000 hardware device hours over these conducting IBM quantum processors. Um, you know, they just, you know, they were able to look at uh, relatively small system sizes still, but they basically, it was literally brute force. You just run the circuit many, many, many times. You bin together the measurement outcomes. You use tomography to, to compute the, de the density matrix, one and two sine, three sine density matrices, and then you, you calculate the entanglement entropy. Um, and, you know, and they found evidence for this transition. Um, so, um, but, but I think, yeah, I'm very excited with I've unpublished work that we're, you know, working on with my a grad student, where we think we might be able to use something called cross entropy benchmarking to, to circumnavigate the um, post selection problem. But I, you know, this is work, work in progress. Um, so, you know, new opportunities in this NISC area, quantum many body theorist, you know, tries to learn some quantum information theory and maybe can try to do something. Um, you know, what I find is that all the young geniuses that are, you know, that, that are coming into the field, no quantum information theory is, you know, from birth almost, what it seems to me at least. <laughs> so I'm, I'm definitely feeling my age in this program here. Um, but, you know, there we are. To mention the climbing up the mountains is not what it used to be, but uh, <laughs> the um, so non equilibrium dynamics and these monitored, you know, open systems are, I think, are interesting. Um, you know, I think to circumnavigate the post selection problem, you basically you have to use the measurement outcomes. You know, you've got a lot of information out, so to do the decoding, you have to use the measurement outcomes in some way. And that usually is involving a classical computation with maybe a machine learning or not. So you're ending up doing something like interactive quantum dynamics, where you, you have your quantum computer, you know, the experimentalists are making measurements, pulling out classical information, taking that classical information, running it through a classical computation. Then you could do feedback and decoding uh, by changing the subsequent um, unitaries and measurements conditioned on the results of this classical computation from the earlier measurement results. Um, this is what is done in active error correction. Um, you know, so, uh, but, but uh, you can ask, you know, can you stabilize new quantum dynamical phases uh, in this quantum computer by, uh, by, you know, by this, by this circle of, of physics, if you will. You know, so for example, can you get, if you have a, can you get a one-dimensional Luttinger liquid you know, in this, uh, you know, could you get a two-dimensional super liquid? Um, you know, I mean, you know, you're making measurements, you're kind of keeping the entropy low. If you have unitaries, you're kind of heating it up. Um, and then you have to control it. You know, so how, how, what can you, what kind of phases can one, quantum dynamical phases can one get using, using, using you know, measurement, feedback, and control? Um, and can one get entirely new quantum phases that we just haven't even thought of? Um, or, so let me just, just then, all right, so monitored systems of these, you know, it's, it's kind of a interesting class of open quantum systems where, which is very rich theoretically and it's very challenging experimentally, but uh, you know, I'm hoping more progress will be made on that front. Um, and this competition between unitary induced entanglement and measurement induced disentanglement is the simplest example where you get 
this entanglement transition. There's lots of open questions. There's many more than I've listed here. Um, and one of the ones that is most exciting for me is, is novel, you know, can you get novel quantidynamical phases in monitored systems with active feedback? Um, and then, you know, more experiments that will be coming as well. So, okay, thank you so much for your attention. I appreciate it. So, More questions from Matthew? Well, because it's a it's a replicated theory, and so. It, you know, if you, if you did, if you had a classical system mechanical model in two dimensions, which didn't involve a replica limit, you could just simulate it at model directly, and you may be able to solve it exactly. Um, so, um, so there is there's a certain limit where the, the nature of that critical point is understood, um, and the limit where if you change the q bit to q dits with d dimensional Hilbert space locally, and you take d to infinity. And that transition becomes a percolation, um, and so. But but away from that limit, we don't understand the nature of that phase transition. Um, and the nature of that phase transition is probably different for the Clifford circuits than it is for you know more generic unitaries. Um, and uh, but it's a, it's a you know, as a as a just a mechanical model with it, it's a. It's it's a conformal field theory, presumably, but it's a non-unitary conformal field theory. But and those are you know pretty poorly understood, is my you know, is, you know, even by the experts. But, uh, so if you remove the restriction to Clifford circuits, do you still have that transition? Yeah, no, totally, definitely do. Yeah, but um, I mean the, to do it look numerically, you. You have to live with looking at twenty qubits, and so you can see you can see the transition. You can try to estimate real exponents, but there's bigger uncertainties. But it's a the method to distinguish whether your circuit is doing something interesting by monitoring dynamics. Yeah, the the nice thing about Clifford is you can just look at bigger systems, and um, but but you need to. But it's a you know very good question. Is it just is it special to Clifford? I mean that you have this entanglement transition, but it's not. I mean, so that both from the system mechanics mapping, as well as the um, you know doing numerical simulations on non-Clifford circuits where you can do maybe twenty qubits, dynamics of twenty qubits. It, it seems that uh, as you change, as you increase your number of density of measurements, you have to have a change. So the surprise only is that it happens with a singularity. Yeah, it could have happened. Well, you can't really be across. It could have happened that a student, when any finite density of measurements is enough to kill the volume or phase. So it's like the phase transition would be at you know zero measurement rate. Then that would be un one uninteresting. Um, so it becomes interesting when there's a finite measurement rate and the measurement rate smaller than the critical value. Then there's an interesting phase. Uh, Volume or phase, and then, then there's a critical value, and then there's the aerial phase when you have more measurements. Can you define some kind of correlation length associated with this? Yeah, you definitely can. And in fact, you know, when you do finite size scaling, it's sensitive to the correlation length. You can get the correlation length exponent out by doing the finite size scaling. And yeah, so the transition is, is, um, it, it's, it's a, you know, it's a, Conventional continuous phase, second order phase transition. Um, even, even if it's universality class, we don't understand, but it's it's scaling. In our conventional stat mech, it requires a difference of symmetry to have a this kind of a, a transition. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not. There's no difference in symmetry, but I mean, it, but but you can. Um, yeah, it's just a, it's a qualitative change in the some long length scale property. The, the, the you, you two phases, 
know, volumal phase and aerial phase, which is qualitatively different, and you can't go smoothly from one to the other. So either there's some intermediate phase or there's a sharp transition, and, and it's the latter, which seems to be the case. Exactly. Um, Claire, sorry, and then. Yeah, could you explain the post selection problem again? I just somehow am not quite getting it. Yeah, okay, so um, let's say I gave you um, the ground state of the quantum harmonic oscillator. I prepared that and I said, you know, measure the position of the particle. You'd measure it once and you'd find it somewhere. But that wouldn't be very helpful. You wouldn't have much information. So I give you another copy, you measure it, then you find it somewhere else. And I give you many, many, many copies and you make many, many, many measurements. Then you get, you know, the Gaussian distribution of the probability of finding the particle. And so likewise, with any quantum system, you know, you need to, um, to, to get a lot of information from it, you need to be able to, be able to make, get many copies of the same system, typically. And, um, and so here, the, the, the challenge is, the post-selection challenge is, when you run the quantum circuit, you're making measurements, you get some measurement outcomes, so you get some final state. Now you run the exact same circuit again, but because of the randomness and measurements, you get a different measurement outcome, so you get a different quantum state. And so you need many copies of one given quantum state to, character, you know, to get character, to characterize or to extract properties of that quantum state, the entanglement entropy. Yeah. A question that is so, so this is all based on microscopic physics and voices. Now, could you think about something similar if you have your know, mainly theory here or what you saw this paper and using quantum mm -hmm. the experiments? They are emerging effective descriptions where your your friends look at how they see visions and are like collective quantities. Can you transfer something like that onto on to there? Like that like, like you we didn't now can do that. When you do that, you can transfer that and, and do that and verify these several systems. So, can, could you do that? Can you do that? Can you get that measurement? Your measurement that is, give you all the information about these different things. You can have mutual information about these different systems. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I think maybe you're talking about sort of effective descriptions or effective yeah. theories. So this statistical analytics mapping is maybe one effective description you know, where the entanglement entropy is determined by an entanglement domain wall. If you have a domain wall across crossing the circuit, you're disentangled of the initial and the final states. But at this stage, I'm not sure I can do better than that, really. Maybe. Um, Does the measurement record itself record this transition? Because, you know, after we've propagated your circuit forward a bunch of times, then to some degree, I can regard all the consequent measurements as being a characteristic of the state of this layer. Well, okay, so it, I'm trying to, I mean, of course, I can projectively measure all, everything all at once, but let's say I take my time to make measurements. Is there some like it, it, correlation in the measurements that indicates that the information has gone or whether it remains? Yeah, gone? so it turns out that the, if you start with two different initial states, then in the volume within the low measurement phase where you aren't making many measurements the distribution function of the measurement outcomes are identical in the large system limit for those two initial states so so in the volume law phase the information that's contained in the initial state initial state one or initial state two um it is not being read out by the, those local measurements. Whereas in the area law phase, you're making enough measurements that you at least can distinguish two different initial states by looking at the measurement distribution outcomes. Um, so, so, in the so in the volume law phase, the fact that the initial state, that, you know, is, is you're, you're blind to it when you make these measurements is why it's a good, you know, sort of, uh, encoder of quantum information because that information in the initial state is, is like hidden um is, is hidden from one and which is what you want i mean so the environment which is making local measurements is not enough to put rid of this post-selection problem i mean can i basically just 
take a very long measurement record and look to see if this time slice is strongly correlated with this time slice? Yeah, well, this is, I think the things we're tr trying to work on is trying to use the distribution to the measurement outcomes to uh, try to get around this post-election challenge. So I, I could tell you in more detail in offline. But... So the transitions you described mostly are second order. Is it possible to do a first order transition? Yeah, is it possible to do a first order transition? Um, I mean, I think the in most of the, the models we're looking at have randomness in there, and you know, and randomness tends to you know, smoothen out a first order transition. So it's possible if you I don't know. I don't know of any examples where you have a first order transition, but I don't think there's any reason why you in principle couldn't. What do you, Oh, Adam, do you think you could have a first order transition? I don't know. I, I'm frankly that you have this t equals zero thing. I couldn't, I mean, sorry, it's like in um, satellite models where the position function is one and the free energy vanishes. And it's hard to see how you could have a free energy across the domain wall between t. Yeah, so. I don't know about a rigorous cycle. In maybe models which don't have randomness in them, and with the Clifford circuit without randomness, and you know, you know periodically placed measurements and k unitaries, maybe maybe some way that you could have a, a sudden qualitative change. I don't know. The, the, the non-random unitaries and with measurements has that ever been is, is randomness absolutely required for randomness is we don't think randomness is absolutely required this is a yeah. conjecture or this evidence well okay i think um what what i don't know is whether or not um i mean the, the, you always have some randomness which is the randomness in the measurement outcome and, and that may be enough randomness um so but um, but with Clifford circuits is very special. I'm not sure that's true. But that's that's enough randomness. But um, the uh, but but looking at Clifford circuits without randomness, I mean, it, you know, we were starting to do that. But it's every different flow case circuit, every different unitary has a different behavior. I mean, it's like the zoo of behavior so the randomness kind of washes things out and makes for you know one phase or two phases nice in that sense is there any zoom no there aren't any questions on zoom uh although if you this is your last chance if you're on zoom and you have a question i'll give you a few seconds to raise your hand it looks like there aren't any questions on zoom and so we're uh, we're almost quarter past four so I think this would be a great time to take the discussion outside. Uh, and we thank Matthew again for being here. Yeah, well, yeah, thanks. Thanks to you all. I really appreciate it. You know, I know you're supposed to come here, but <laughs> there's no rules when you're adults, right? I mean, so. <laughs>